we just worship you right now in this place. Jesus, you rose from the dead. We will worship you forever. You live right now. And we just thank you that we can know you. We thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for the privilege that we have just to be in relationship with you, to know that you are for us and you are with us and that you want to give us a forever family. You want us to worship and be with you forever and you want us to be part of your loving family forever. We thank you that you have such a beautiful plan for each person, that you do not want anyone to be lost, that you want everyone to have eternal life. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's great to be with you all today. Um, If you haven't been here last week, we're continuing in the book of Mark and Last week, Rod actually did a really great message, and so I encourage you to watch it if you haven't watched it. And he actually started off um, with a story where we're going to revisit it again, and it's all about Jesus and Jesus' family. Um, so he shared first about that, and he briefly went about that, shared about that, because then he said, I was going to share more about it this week. And then he went all into the details about how he was having problems with the religious leaders and how they wanted to kill him and basically how they thought he was possessed by the devil. If you don't remember that, it was really quite an interesting sermon. He went into um, uh, how they were calling him the Lord of the Dung, or the Lord of the Manure. So it was a pretty terrible name to call Jesus. But today we are going to more focus, we're going to focus more on Jesus and the troubles he had with his family. So who here has ever had problems with their family? Probably everyone has had some problems with their family. Well, Jesus had trouble with his family too. I used to think, no, Jesus would have had a perfect family, but actually, as, as it turns out, he had quite a lot of trouble with his family too. So we're just going to read the passage from last week that Rod shared. This is Mark chapter 3, 20 to 21. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, He is out of his mind. So basically, that's a way of saying he's crazy. Now, I, when I worked up in Asia, worked in a mental health facility. And sometimes there were some people who were put in that facility who had people after them who wanted to kill them. Or they had a really, really big debt. Now, I'm not saying this is a good thing to do, but this is what their family did. Their family went, no, that person's crazy, so that they would protect them. And then they put them in this facility to try to hide them, saying, no, they're just crazy. Now, maybe Jesus' family was doing this, we don't know for certain, but maybe this was his family's way of trying to protect him. After all, the religious leaders wanted to kill him. So maybe they were just saying, ha, na, na, he's just a bit out of his mind, you know. Come with us, Jesus, because the word here actually is to take charge of him. It's like to arrest him. They were forcibly trying to actually take him. Or maybe they actually really did think that he was getting a bit out of his mind. We don't actually know for certain, but all we know is that his family was trying to stop him from this mission. He was really, really busy. He had crowds following him. He had all the riffraff following him. And and his family were like, we're not into this. We want you out of this. Was it for protection or was it that they actually thought his mission had started to go a bit strange? We actually don't know. But it's not the first time that someone has pretended to be a bit crazy. David, in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel, he had a time when he pretended he was out of his mind too in order to try not to get killed. So maybe his family was remembering that. We, we don't know. But it's interesting to think what his family was thinking of him at this time in order to want to actually bring him out of this situation. So the scripture we've got today is Mark 31, 35. Then Jesus' mother and brother arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my brothers? Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those sitting, seated in a circle around him, and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. 
So after Jesus is already having this altercation with the religious leaders and they're calling him possessed by the evil one, here his family is back wanting to take him out. So he had a, pe- he had a crowd around him. It probably, from the rest of Mark, would have been, could have been tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, the riffraff, you know, and his family's like, come on, get out of here. This is not the kind of person we think you are. I think Jesus, we don't know how a lot about Jesus, but he probably would have been a nice guy, a nice kind of good guy. And they were like, we want you to be a certain kind of religious leader. And maybe he wasn't fitting the picture of what that his family was, you know. He, he, his family was like, we want you to be this kind of good teacher and you're turning into something a little bit different. So basically today is about forever family. Who wants to be part of a loving family forever? I do. I would like to be part of a loving family. Maybe that is your family or maybe it's not. But we're going to explore this topic today um, of the idea of a forever family. So Jesus' family struggled to get him. Who has people in their family who struggle to get you as a follower of Jesus? Most people have someone in their family who struggles to get them. When I came to faith, my good Catholic family, I think they thought I joined a cult. I think they were very worried that I joined a cult. They they thought this place was a cult. They were like, oh no, what is this? This is not Catholic. So they were really concerned and they did at times really think I was out out of my mind for becoming so devoted to following Jesus. In Matthew 13, 54 to 58, we start actually to see a little bit more of a picture of the struggle that Jesus' family was having with him. And we start to see that Jesus actually had quite a big family. So I'm going to read it from Matthew 13, 54 to 58. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in the synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and this miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't they his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they looked and they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not with honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. So here we actually see that Jesus, he had four brothers and he had a couple of sisters. Now we also see here that the the father, the dad, Jesus' dad, I won't go into the whole story of Christmas because I haven't got time, but I'm assuming you know that story for most of you. But it has, uh, he had Joseph. Now, we don't hear any more about Joseph after Jesus kind of got lost and left behind in the temple. That's the last time we hear about Joseph, which is probably why he's, it's called the carpet and son here. So that might actually have meant that Jesus kind of grew up in a single parent, for some, as a single parent home. For at least some part of his life, he was in a single parent home. So he had four brothers and he had some sisters and they didn't believe in him. In this here, it says he with, was without honour, they didn't have faith, they didn't get who he was. So his family were not getting who he was. He was not, he was not they, they couldn't understand what he was doing and what he was about. The next bit is in John 7, 1, 13. We also get another picture of Jesus' family. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works that you do. No one who wants to become a a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. So again, we get a picture. His brothers, maybe they started believing in his miracles but they didn't really get who he was. He, Jesus had started doing things in secret to not get a crowd. His brothers wanted him to have a crowd. They wanted him to become famous. They wanted him to do things in, in public. But it says here that they didn't believe in him. They still had not got a picture of who he is. They still probably thought he's just a, a good guy. They didn't get who he was, whereas other people around him started to get who he was. 
It continues. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, but not publicly, but in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the leaders. So we start to see this kind of struggle that many people have. Is Jesus, is he just a good man? I think his, fa- his family probably knew he was a good guy. When I was young, I just thought Jesus was a good guy. He was a good teacher and he was a good guy. If you ask many people who don't know Jesus yet, who just kind of out there in the world, what do you believe about Jesus? They'll go, oh yeah, he was a good bloke. He was a good guy. He was a good teacher, a good moral teacher. Many people would say that about Jesus. Very seldom do you come back across anyone who would say Jesus was possessed by the evil one. I've never really come across that. Most Australians, people from overseas who I meet, he is just a good guy. The thing is, Jesus didn't really leave that option. I thought that for a really long time and it wasn't until I started reading the Bible and then I was like, this guy, he's not describing himself just like as a good teacher. He's not just the same as all the other good teachers in other religions because that's what lots of people like to think, isn't it? All religions are the same and there's been lots and lots of good teachers, good moral teachers. That's what I hear all the time. But if you actually start to read the Bible and see what Jesus says about himself, He's definitely not saying he's just a good teacher. So what does he say about himself? He says, I am the Christ, the Messiah. I am the bread of life. I am the truth. I am the I am. And that's what in the Old Testament they used to refer to as the name for God. So here he's actually (laughs) relating himself to the same as God. The one who forgives sins, the saviour, I am the light of the world. I am the way. I am the son of God, the future judge of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the giver of eternal life. This doesn't sound like someone who's just a good teacher. So this is why they started to want to kill him. They're either like he is possessed by the evil one. He is deceived. He is crazy. There's something going on with him because these are not the words of a normal person. I've met many people who think they're Jesus, and I tell you what, they're not quite there. They, they're, they, when, they, when you meet people who think they're Jesus, there's something not quite right. So was he like one of that? Was he thinking, was he deceived about who he was? Well, obviously, one of the most famous people who wrote about this kind of topic was C.S. Lewis, and I read this book when I was on my journey of coming to faith. C.S. Lewis writes, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronising nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He had not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So you can see, if you've struggled to understand who Jesus is, well, you're not alone. Lots of people have struggled. It is part of the journey to actually go, was he just a good man? A lot of people get attracted to Jesus at first for his teachings. Yes, he's a good guy. He's a good teacher. But the sooner, sooner or later, if you read the word of God, you come up with the fact that he just, doesn't, he just doesn't describe himself as a good teacher. There are many powerful things that he says about himself. And the question is, what do you actually do with these things? So, is he just a good guy and a moral teacher? Or do you actually believe that he is something more than that? His, par- his mother, Jesus... Actually, they, they, this is the scripture that we've had here, Mark 3, 31, 35, where his, his parents are coming, his family is coming after him. They're kind of looking and he's looking around. So how did he respond? How did he respond when his family came to him and said, 
He said, whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. So the question is now, if Jesus is, that's his response. His family, could you imagine that? They would have taken offence. I think they really would have got offended. In that culture where family was so important, they would have got majorly offended. Imagine if, you know, you did that to your family. Like you're having a little church Bible study and your family's come and you're like, I'm just with my real family, <laughs> you know, whoever does God's will. He, they would have got offended for sure. But Jesus had a purpose in this. He had a purpose in offending them, I believe. Now, what does John 6.40 say? It says, for, for my, will, God, my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up on the last day. That is such powerful words about what God's will is. Do you know what God's will is for us? To give us eternal life. I don't know why anyone wouldn't want eternal life. Nowadays, if you look on YouTube, heaps of people are trying to work out how to live longer. They're trying to, you know, do all these studies and work out how to make sure that people can live longer or even live eternally, you know. Here it is, Jesus saying, I will give you eternal life. I will resurrect you. It's such powerful words. That is God's will for every single person. It says in Matthew 21, 32, there's two stories about, there's a parable about two sons and Jesus, again, he rebukes the chief priests and the elders for failing to do the will of the Father. Specifically, they did not repent and believe. So the basic thing that Jesus was trying to get people to do at that time is to believe in who he, who he was, believe in what he was saying about himself, repent from their sins and accept him. Now, the religious leaders at the time, they couldn't handle it. They weren't accepting it. That's why they were trying to, to kill him. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first command and the greatest, the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So much. I mean, we could go into a whole sermon about God's will, but I believe that the main message that he kept saying over and over again was to love God and to love each other. That he wanted to create a family that was full of God's love, a new kind of family that was full of God's love. We all know this one from John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. There was a survey that has been done recently in our area, and the thing that came up as the biggest issue was social isolation. There is a whole world out there of people who've come from broken families, who've come from hurting families. And I believe Jesus wanted to create a family where the people loved each other so much that people from hurting families could come in. Broken people and people who felt isolated and rejected and people who had, had, had no sense of family. That his goal was to create a loving family. That he wants us to be that loving family. So that people are hurting and broken can come in. Now I've had that experience myself in this church 20 years ago when I came to this church. There are people who have become my mother's and my fathers, and my sisters, and my brothers in this church. And I am so glad that I stuck in the same church because by sticking in the church, it's like sticking with family. People become your family. People have known you for so long that they are your brothers, that they are your sisters, they are your... And I have people who I love like a mother. I have people who in this church who I love like a father. And I am closer to them than probably my own family because my own family doesn't share in the same relationship that these people do. And so I am so, so privileged. But doing church family can be hard. God wants us to be a loving family, but it can be hard. I've had bad experiences too and probably some of you have had bad experiences as well because we don't get it right. I've definitely got it wrong. You guys might have at times got it wrong too. One of the things I learnt when I went, worked up in Asia was that I was part of a, a little a ministry team and at first I loved it. Every week it was so much fun. 
we would um, have meetings on Saturdays and sometimes we'd focus on prayer, sometimes we'd focus on strategy, sometimes we'd focus on pastoral care, sometimes we'd have socials. I absolutely loved it. Anyway, one day I was watching a movie, one of those movies where um, Americans save the world from aliens. You know how Americans are always saving the world from uh, aliens. Anyway, I was watching one of these movies and um, I felt this quiet voice of the Holy Spirit say, watch what happens now. Their mission will be destroyed. And I was like, what? Where's that voice coming from? This is so random, you know. Anyway, so what was happening is in the movie, the Americans, they were, you know, saving the world from the aliens and they were making a lot of progress. But suddenly they had a, an, a, a, one of the aliens, you know, disguised itself and like pretended it was one of them and turned them all inside, got them all fighting against each other. And of course, what happened to their mission? They started getting defeated. They started losing the war that they were having. And I was like, hmm, that's very interesting. Very, very interesting theory there. Anyway, not so long, about a year or two after that, um, this, this group of people that I was with, some of them had went and, went and did a, a training on a new kind of method on how to do ministry. And they got really, really, really passionate about it. And they were like, this is the way, this is the way, what you're doing is not the way. And anyway... Cut a long story short, it was terrible. They, we, we split up. Our whole team split up because people got too, like, this is the way to do ministry. And I, I, I learned a lot through that experience. And it tells me, always keep love the most thing, as the most important thing. We have unity around who we believe Jesus is. And after that, love is always the most important thing. Never let opinions on ministry or how to do, you know, what songs you like or how the church service should go or any of those kinds of things. Never, ever let that become more important than loving one another because that can destroy the mission. The mission is for us to be a loving community so that people who are broken and hurting can receive love. But if we're fighting internally, then that blocks that ministry, that blocks that. And so I just really learned a lot, a lot about that. And sometimes it's very easy, if you're anything like me, you can get on your high horse about a certain thing. Okay, it's okay to have opinions, but never to the point of stopping loving people. And I really learned that lesson through, through that experience. He wants us to be a loving family. That is his will now, he says something pretty radical in, in Jesus, as he does. In Luke 14, 26, he says, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, this is NLT version, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. I remember reading that going, what, what is that about? You know, why is he saying hate? How am I supposed to hate my family? You know, when you're a new Christian, you don't, you, know, you don't understand a lot of things, so you're thinking, wow, what does that actually mean? Now, clearly, I've learnt since then that in the Hebrew language, the contrast between love and hatred is used to communicate preference. So it's, it wasn't saying literally hate. It was saying Jesus has to be given a preference, the first priority over everybody else. Now, how do we know that? Because he teaches in so many other scriptures to love your natural family. He teaches you to love your enemies, let alone your natural family. So we know that God's will is for us to love our natural family. But that doesn't mean that sometimes some people have to make a very, very hard choice to follow Jesus. I have worked with many people who've had to make that choice when as a result of choosing to follow Jesus, they have lost their whole family. They have even lost their children. I've had to minister with people who've bored their eyes out because their, their, their choice to actually follow Jesus had huge consequences. Most of us don't experience that. Most of us just have to kind of work out what does it mean in our everyday life. So for me, when God was calling me to leave my career and go to Bible college, I had a pretty interesting time. People thought I was a bit out of my mind. But that's nothing compared to what I've seen some people have to go through where they really, really do lose those fa their family. But these people never usually give up loving their family and often their family does come back to them because Jesus wants us, his will is 
for us to love our natural family. His will is for us to love him first. And if we love him first, he's going to fill us with a love for our natural family. It says in Ephesians 5.33, to love your wives. It says to honour your mothers and fathers in Ephesians 6.2. It says in 1 Timothy 5.8, anyone who does not love, does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So we can see God's will is for us to love our natural family. His will is for us to believe in him, to receive eternal life, to be people of love, but also to love our natural family. His will is, and we can see this in in John 19, 26 to 27, where we actually see Jesus take care of his mother. Right when he is suffering on the cross, he is still thinking about his mother. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, that actually was John, he said to a woman, here is your son, and to his disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his house. So it's interesting. You can see Jesus' love for his mother, but he also connect his mother with one of his disciples who was part of his new kind of family. Where were his brothers at this point? We don't actually know, but we will soon, in a minute, find out what was happening. Because his family, Jesus' natural family, became part of his forever family too. And that's what's so exciting. They, I think they went from a journey of just believing he was a good guy and a good teacher. Maybe he's a bit out of his mind. We don't get him. To by the time we get to this passage here, we actually see his family, his natural family starting to come in. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 3 to 7 says, For what I have received I passed on to you, as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is Paul, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of them are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to the apostles. Now, this many commentators say this is James, his brother. He appeared to his brother after he raised from the dead. Not only did he appear to to his brother, he appeared to like 500 people. And by the time this was written, these people were still alive. I mean, could you imagine? That's why so many people believed in this story because he, he raised from the dead and he appeared to so many people at the same time. That's why they had such faith. So here we see that James, his brother, was one who actually Jesus appeared to after he raised. Could you imagine being James, Jesus' brother, like all your life living with this guy? Oh, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a good teacher. You know, okay, he's gone a bit crazy in his ministry. Oh, my gosh, he just raised from the dead and has appeared to me. I mean, what a powerful experience that would have been. In Acts 1.14, all these, all, all these with one accord... That's right, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now, this is actually before when Pentecost is about to happen with 120 people. Right there were his brothers and his mother. So his natural family became part of his forever family. They became part of his spiritual family. And so I think it's really encouraging to see that journey of a natural, his natural family to go through that and to actually end up believing. James actually became the leader of the Jerusalem church. It says in Acts 15, 13 and 19 and is called the pillar of the church. As you probably know, most commentators say that he wrote the book of James. He never seems to use his position of Jesus as blood relative. Rather, he calls him a servant of Jesus. So he went from this is my brother to this is my Lord, this is my saviour, this is the person who I worship. It was such a powerful shift. The book of Jude is also considered to be written by one of Jesus' brothers. Again, he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So such a beautiful story that I thought would encourage you to actually see his family going from not believing, out of his, he's out of, my, out of his mind, to actually starting to believe. And that's what I believe Jesus wants for all of us as well. To believe that we have eternal life and that we're part of Jesus' forever family. 
You here are my brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers forever. I will know you forever. Each one of you people who believes, I hope you like me enough because I will be with you forever. (laughs) We will be in heaven forever. Isn't that exciting that we are going to be a family forever? I think that's just an incredible thing and I hope it inspires us to love one another because we will be a loving family forever. So let's be a loving family here on earth. Let's, even though we have some differences on some opinions, that's okay. We have the main thing that we believe in, and that is who Jesus is, and that is what unifies us. We can have different opinions on some things, but let's come together on the main thing, and let's focus on being a loving family, not only so that we enjoy it, but also for a world out there that's hurting, so that people who are hurting can come in and you can be their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and their fathers and you can help restore people. So I love this message and I love that you are my forever family. So I hope we can enjoy each other as our forever family. But God also wants our natural family to be our forever family too. Who here has people in their family that they want to be part of their forever family? Most people do. Most people do. Now, you might have some people in your family that you're having a hard time with. Who doesn't? But God still wants us to pray and pray and pray and pray for them to be part of our natural family, to become part of our forever family too. My, um, my grandfather, he was a Catholic who went to church every Sunday. So, you know, I was a bit like, oh, what's he, where is he? He didn't really talk about his faith much. And... Um, while I was over in Asia, he, he had a stroke and he was in hospital. Um, I was at a really extremely busy time, so I didn't know whether he was going to pass away or what. So, But one morning I woke up and I could not stop praying for him. I just, for two hours, I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying for my grandfather. And then what happened is I felt the manifest presence of Jesus. It was like he just looked at me with this big smile And next to him was my grandfather with this huge, huge smile on his face. And together it was like they were both looking at me with so much joy and such a big faith, such a big smile. And I was like, wow. And then my mum rang up and she said, your grandfather has passed away. And I was like, wow. It was like God's special way of saying to me, it is okay. Like I didn't understand his faith but there was something in him that believed. I believe that till the very end, people can call on the name of Jesus and be saved. And so I believe God did something. And he did that so that, because I couldn't come back with the funeral, he helped me to know that my grandfather was going to be part of my forever family. And so I just want to take a few moments, and just, just in your heart, just pray for people who you want to have in your forever family. Just take a few moments and then I'll wrap up in prayer. Yeah, Lord, we give our family to you, our natural family. We ask that you would show us how to love them well to love in a way that pleases you, to love you first and then to you fill us with your love for our family, for our natural family. We want to see each one of them come to know you so that they are part of our forever family. I pray that for the ones that are really hard for us to love, we need more of your grace. Show us how to do it when we're really struggling, Lord. And I pray for this family here. I thank you that this is part of my forever family here. And I pray that we would just be a church that is known for our love for one another, that we deeply love you and we love each other so that we can be a place that is a safe place for a hurting world to come and to to receive a new kind of family that would love them and heal them so that they can know you and that they can have real love. We just pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.